So on on those grounds, I'd be interested because something that you've talked about a lot recently is the idea of anti-racism and kind of the third wave of anti-racism. And you had a piece entitled The Virtue Signalers Won't Change the World. Third wave anti-racism makes sense and fits into the longer struggle, but it's a dead end. And so first I want to talk about anti-racism and then I want to get back to the concept of virtue signaling. So First and foremost, when you're talking about third wave anti-racists, of whom are you speaking? Because I, I want to get really specific with, you know, what are the arguments you think that third wave anti-racists are making and why do you think those arguments are bad? Um, a third wave anti-racist can be of any color these days. And so that's one thing. It's a race neutral concept. And what they're arguing is that what we should be concerned with in terms of improving humanity, primarily, should be eliminating racist bias in all of its forms. And I don't think anybody would have disagreed that you wanted to get rid of racist bias, say, 40 years ago. It's kind of pushing it, 50 or 60. But there was an awareness starting in the 70s that racism was not just burning a cross on somebody's lawn or calling them a bad name, and that you wanted to make people examine you know, the, the inner racist inside of them. That was something that was important. And black people had a responsibility to help white people do it. I watched my mother do it. She taught a course called, I think, Literally Racism 101 in her social work program at Temple University. And I understand the impulse. But I think there's been a mission creep lately where it's a matter of trying to exterminate racism even in the face of empiricism sometimes, and not only in terms of whether the racism exists, but in terms of whether anybody's being helped. And that's an important point in the face of empiricism, in the face of an argument that you could actually make coherently to say that that immigrant recently from Japan. And also, regardless of whether it's really a matter of fostering justice for, for example, poor black people, it's become a way of indicating that you're a good person. And in the same way as language drifts, it's not that anybody's doing this on purpose. It's not that it's something cynical, but it's just gotten to the point that you spray for racism, so to speak, as part of showing that you're good in the same way that somebody 500 years ago in Europe was showing that they had faith. And the thing is, it ends up retarding in many ways and obscuring what it is to actually get justice for people who need it. I think we've pulled away from what the goals of the forefathers were. The issue is not whether racism exists, and the issue is not whether racism has effects. I fully appreciate and accept and understand that. The problem is where the anti-racism ends up requiring faith in the sense of requiring that we suspend our disbelief and not ask too many questions. And what I mean by that is, for example, suppose you say, well, okay, yeah, the N-word is a terrible thing and people should neither wield it, you know, calling people that, or casually use it, you know, in, in reference to black people. The idea that that's normal has to go. Okay, fine. Now, about 25 years ago, there was a kind of a mission creep where the new idea became, nor is anybody who isn't black supposed to even refer to the word. You're not even supposed to put your mouth around the shapes of the sounds. Can't even refer to it. And it ends up sounding almost like the sort of thing we associate with cultures very different from ours where there's a taboo where you learn about it in an anthropology class and you think, well, that doesn't necessarily make sense, but that's just the way they do it and you kind of walk on because we're not of that culture. But it takes on that air. Now, if somebody asks, what kind of black strength is it if you claim that somebody can't even say the N-word even to refer to it, to just utter that sequence of sounds is supposed to leave somebody clutching in the corner, destroyed and thinking about slavery. That's all it takes. Doesn't that indicate a certain kind of delicacy? Is that black strength? Now, there are many answers that you could give. But for many people, there's a, a visceral resistance. There's a rolling of the eyes. There's an idea that, well, you just don't get it. And that get it is what I mean by the faith, because there's an extent to which, as you, I'm sure you know, faith requires getting it. It can't be completely explained beyond a certain point. You say, why do you have faith in this thing that you'll never have concrete evidence of the existence of, et cetera? And that's a point where you can't argue with logic anymore. And that ends up happening with race. So very quickly, another example is um, here in New York City, there are a top four public high schools where you have to take a nasty little standardized test to get in. And for the past 20 years or so, 
black students have not done well on that test, and there have been ever fewer who have gotten into schools like, for example, Stuyvesant. Now, one way of looking at it, and I'm quite sure that this is the way the grand old civil rights leaders of 50 years ago would have looked at it, would have been, is, okay, we're going to teach people in the black community how to get better at that test. We've got to get the word out. We've got to make people realize that there's so many free programs for learning how to you know, rehearse for the test. And we're going to make sure that black people can show what they're made of on that test because black people certainly can. That made perfect sense 50 years ago. And frankly, it makes perfect sense now. But the woke way of looking at it these days is to say, well, if black people don't do well on the test, it must be racist. Now, if you try to specify how, now, yes, 30, 40 years ago, you could find tests like that that ask questions about wine and skiing. But that hasn't been the case since roughly early in the Reagan administration. And so you say, again, how is the test racist? And then there's some people, sort of Afrocentric types, who will say, well, there's a different black kind of learning. People have literally said, people with PhDs, you can't expect black children to be that precise. There are people who say openly, you know, two interviewers, well, black people just aren't good at math and they're black. That's the sort of thing you get. And I think, you know, both you and I are kind of rolling our eyes at that. So that won't work. So, OK, how's the test racist? Well, simply in that black people don't do as well on it. That means that the test is a bigot, that it's inappropriate to give black kids that test because they're not as good at it. What do you mean? You're not supposed to ask already to many people. My having pushed it that far makes me an aging, you know, kind of martinet who doesn't get it. But what don't I get? But instead, Mayor de Blasio, you know, who's married to a black person and has a black son, actually decides that what we need to do is just pull the test. Why? For inclusion, so that black people are included. These are really weird arguments. Now, I'm not saying that they're crazy. I'm not saying that a person might not sit down and make the case. But notice how seldom anybody even tries. We just throw these words around. That's faith. The idea that the test is racist because black people don't do as well at it. And so to show what we're made of, to show that we're good people, what we're going to do is make sure that the black kids don't have to take the test. That's a very modern kind of anti-racism. And I think it's harmful because, for example, that means that legions of black kids in New York City will not learn the arbitrary but necessary knack of sitting down and taking that kind of test in order to get ahead to the sorts of opportunities that give people the money and the horizons that you desire an adult to have. So it's that sort of thing. I'm not saying that racism doesn't exist. I'm not saying it doesn't have effects. I know it where I see it. But the issue is how we're addressing it lately, and it's become more subjective than objective.